So last week, I had the opportunity of going to my Spanish teacher's church, and I was able to listen to a Spanish sermon, and I got to be a part of their praise team, and I also sang some songs in Spanish, and so I thought it'd be really interesting if I sung one of those songs for you today. Um, it's really recognizable. It's, this, is why, this is how I thank the Lord um, in English, um, and the chorus is... This is how I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak. So I will sing, this is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is how I thank the Lord. This is how I thank the Lord for loving me and keeping me. So I will sing, this is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is how I thank the Lord. So I'm going to sing it in Spanish. So. Faltan las palabras Esta vida no alcanza Para entender Lo que has de merecer Todos mis fracasos, lo que quise ocultar, todo lo has borrado, asumes lo mejor de mí. Quiero agradecerte Dios, mi salvador, mi protector, te canto hoy. Quiero agradecerte hoy, por toda Dios, quiero agradecerte Dios. Todo mi afecto, todo lo que tengo doy, la suma de mi asombro, se mide en mi adoración. Quiero agradecerte Dios, mi salvador, mi protector, te canto y quiero agradecerte hoy, por toda Dios, quiero agradecerte Dios. Quiero 
agradecerte Dios por tu amor que me guardó te canto y quiero agradecerte hoy por toda Dios quiero agradecerte Dios cantaré cantaré te daré protector te canto y quiero agradecerte hoy por toda Dios quiero agradecerte 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 Dios Nothing is better than 
worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are
I will say to you as I start today that sometimes I'm not real crazy about sermon titles. Uh, sometimes they just kind of go, uh, I see a sermon title and I go, eh. <laughs> and sometimes I look at my own sermon titles and I go, eh. <laughs> and so I'm not throwing rocks at anybody else. Sometimes they just maybe are confusing or they're a little vague or you just don't get it, or I don't present it well enough. Now, some of them, you know, last week I, I talked about groaning creation. That was pretty descriptive in the past. I've uh, Two or three of my favorites are fear stinks that live without it. Uh, you know, we did we know Jesus before Christmas? Uh, you know, those are somewhat descriptive of what we want to talk about. Well, the, the title for today's sermon, I've kind of gone, eh. <laughs> uh, but it is tied to something that is very powerful and very necessary. And the title of for, day, for today's sermon is The Effective Unit of the Christian Experience. Now, to just define that a little bit, I guess we need to think about what is a unit. Uh, you know, and I think about, well, what unit did you serve with in the army? Or what unit are you a part of in the police force? What group do you identify with? And so I'm saying that in our Christian experience that there is, maybe I needed to say, the most effective unit. Because we have several units, several facets of our Christian experience. But what is the most effective? Or what is the basic unit? And to illustrate some of this, as I was preparing this sermon this week, I had a realization that was really emphatic and somewhat shocking because my realization was is that there are people that can be Christians, believers, have Jesus Christ in their life, and they can come to church regularly and still, after many years, they never experience being a part of the Christian community. And so I'll, I, I want to tell you just a little illustration, a little story. Now, this is a fictitious story. It's something that I made up in my brain just for illustrating this point. And this is a story about a man I'll call Sam Jones. And Sam is a man 45 years old, and he's been a Christian for... 20 years. He became a Christian as a young adult at age 24, 25. Now, remember this is fictional, but Sam comes to church most every Sunday. And he comes sometimes for the 9.30 worship service and sometimes for the 11 o'clock worship service. And Sam comes into the sanctuary just about maybe two minutes before the service starts. And in the service, he sits about halfway back, and he listens very carefully. He, he wants to worship. He sings some of the songs. He appreciates the worship that the music brings to all of us. And then when the pastor comes up, Sam, he listens to the words and listens to Scripture and listens to what the, the preacher has to say. And then when the service is over, pretty quickly, because Sam's not real excited about being around a lot of people, he exits the back door and is gone. Now, at home, Sam has some devotional pursuits. He will read scripture, he will pray, he will do some devotional reading. And so all of that is very good, very effective, very much a part of what all of us should be doing. However, however, I'm going to tell you that in my fictional story, I'm concerned because I would have to say that there's every chance that in the 20 years of Sam Jones' spiritual life or Christian life, he has never been a part of the Christian community. Because in everything I just said, did you hear anything about relationships? Did you hear anything about interpersonal connection between Sam 
and other brothers and sisters in the family. No, I purposefully, since I designed the story, I did not put anything in there because it occurs to me, and I hope I'm not talking to anybody, and, and well, yes, I'm sorry. I just told a little fib. If I'm stepping on your toes, I'm glad I'm stepping on your toes <laughs> because I'm interested in us, all of us, in the Christian experience, being a part of the Christian community. And that, in my story, Sam Jones just was not. And I feel that that is a tragic situation. That is a loss. And part of what I'm going to talk about today is helping you and I focus on what I believe is the most effective or the basic unit of the Christian experience. And that is relationships in small groups. Now, small groups, what do I mean? Your Bible study group, your Sunday school class, your fellowship class, what, whatever term you want to put on it, but the small groups is the emphasis because our friend Sam Jones was not ever in, and my story was not ever in a small group. He came to the big group. Again, that's good. I'm glad you're here. I believe in this. I believe in our gathering. I believe in our worship. But this is not enough. That we need to have interpersonal relationships. Now, I've said to you before, and I will always say, I believe it for the, in the depths of my being, that relationships are the most important things in the world. Now, that may sound unusual to you, and I've had it challenged many, many times, and that's okay. I don't mind a challenge, but I want you to know that in my experience and in my life and in what I've understood about other people, other brothers and sisters, that relationships are the most important things in the world. First, your relationship with Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Beyond that, your relationship with your family or with your church family or with your friends or with your working associates or people that mean something to you, relationships are the most important things in the world. And I say that because I've experienced it and I know that, but I also say that because Scripture and the very commands and the instructions from Jesus, Jesus himself fit what I'm saying, that relationships are the most important things in the world. Let me share with you from the 13th chapter of John, verse 34 and 35. Because Jesus said to his disciples 2,000 years ago, the night before he was crucified, and he still says the exact same thing to King's Grand Baptist Church right here today. Because he says, a new command I give you, love one another. There's relationships. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. He's not mincing words at all here, folks. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, he said that three times in there. And so there is relationships. And so in the Christian experience, there is an absolute command. It's not an option. There's a command to love one another. Well, our friend Sam Jones comes in two minutes before, leaves immediately at the end of the benediction or the end of the service, and he does not have enter in it, any interrelationship with any of his other Christian brothers and sisters. How is there going to be a development of a love relationship? It can't happen. In the small group, when you're with other Christian people and you share your life and you live your life and you communicate and you are open yes i believe in being honest and open and you also receive prayerfully from other brothers and sisters then you begin to build this kind of loving relationship that jesus has asked for now based on this command and it is that a command jesus christ commanded us to love one another and I'm saying that it is reflected through Scripture in many, many places that we are to be involved in small groups and groups of relationship. I want to share with you and remind you 
that Jesus modeled this whole principle because didn't he immediately, as he began his ministry, didn't he establish a small group? There were 12 guys that hung out with him. <laughs> there were 12 guys that he called apostles or disciples. There were 12 men that he chose because in the 6th chapter of Luke, here's what it says. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying. And when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, which he also designated as apostles. Now, surely you see in that statement from Scripture, the 6th chapter of Luke, that the first thing Jesus did was he prayed about it. Well, Jesus prayed often. And he sought wisdom and, and choice. And it also seems to imply that maybe the disciples were many at that time. There was a, a whole group, maybe more than just the twelve, because it says, and when morning came, he called his disciples to, to him and chose. So it seems like he chose out of this group twelve men to serve as the apostles. This was Jesus' small group. And this group was formed immediately at the beginning of his, his ministry. Remember the follow me statements that we've made right here in the recent past? Jesus looked at Peter and John and Andrew and all those fellows and said, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Well, this is almost the first thing that he did. In his ministry, he didn't wait till he was in the midst of the three, three and a half years that he spent ministry. He didn't wait until the end. He did that at the beginning because he knew, and we need to know, that in the small group there is teaching and instruction and training and life, lifestyle. And Jesus lived this lifestyle with his 12 disciples. And the fact is, and this just illustrates what I'm about to say, illustrates to you how important this small group was to him because in Scripture we find out that his small group, his disciples, his 12 associates, they were more important to him than even his biological family because in the 12th chapter of Matthew we read this. It says, While Jesus was still talking to the crowd... His mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Now this may sound harsh for you, but it is what's in Scripture. Someone came to Jesus and told him, Your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. Well, what did Jesus say? He said, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. He's talking about his disciples. He's talking about his small group. They were vital to even his ministry, to his spirit. He, remember, he was human as well as totally God. But in his humanness, and I believe even in his divinity, he needed relationships, and he found the relationships in his small group, and they were vital. They were valuable to him. Now, also, not only were they vital and, and valuable to him, but he used his small groups as what I might call assistants or associates in his ministry. Jesus was ministering to people and dealing with people and and teaching people, and driving out demons, and healing people. But he relied on these 12, his small group, to be a part of that whole ministry. Because in the 10th chapter of Matthew, it says, verse 1 says, He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority. He commissioned them. He gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And then in verses 5 through 8 of chapter 10 of Matthew, 
It goes on to say, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or any, in, enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of God is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Now who is he talking to there? His 12 disciples. His small group. The basic or the most important unit of our Christian experience. Now, here at King's Grant, and particularly in the next eight weeks, through the leadership of Pastor Scott and his discipleship team, and through the leadership of your Bible study teachers, your Sunday school class teachers, and the adult classes, we're going to be involved in what's called a focus refocus of our small groups. And I am up here. I had another sermon prepared for today. And about three days ago, I thought, no, this whole thing with the refocus is starting next Sunday. And I felt really impressed that I needed to do what I'm doing today. And that is to be before all of you as a congregation and say, this is a part of our emphasis, it is vital, and we're dealing with the small group, which is the most effective unit of our Christian experience. Through our small groups, we're able to experience relationships and to love one another and to learn and to share. And I'm going to read now. Now, let me say this before I read this section. Pastor Scott has put this together for our benefit and for glorifying God and, and using the small group to, to grow us up even more, to teach us. And much of this material he has gleaned from a man who was his mentor in discipleship and in Bible study and in small groups. But also Pastor Scott, in his knowledge, and he is extremely knowledgeable and does an excellent job with this type of material. He has written and ex kind of amplified some of this material and applied it to King's Grant Baptist Church because we are looking for this next eight weeks, starting next Sunday, we're looking for these eight weeks to be something very practical and applicable to our church. So please listen to part of what Pastor Scott has written it is very direct, it is very challenging, it is very impo important for me and for you and for all of us to hear this because he says, during the month of August, the transition team, now that's valuable to me because that's part of my work as transitional pastor and these 15 people on the transition team are a part of my team, our team to do some of the transition work. It says, during the month of August, our trans transition team was tasked with evaluating the five functions of the church. Now, if you don't know the five functions of the church, we need to look at that. We need to think about that. We need to learn that. The five functions of the church are evangelism, discipleship, worship, ministry, and fellowship. Five functions. Now, any healthy church needs to be involved. And so Scott is saying our transition team was tasked with evaluating that. And he goes on to say, As we know, the church living up to these functions transforms King's Grant from a cruise ship to a battleship. Yeah, let that one sink in. We need to be about the whole business of fighting for God's goodness from a cruise ship to a battleship. We must be on mission with God to build his kingdom. We are not just a social club for believers. While the church must embrace and live out these five functions, it is imperative that our small groups do the same. So how can our classes do evangelism, 
provide discipleship, engage in worship, serve in ministry, and fellowship together. Our classes must be more than just a place to share prayer requests and study a biblical lesson. We must be intentional living out the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. If we are going to be a church ready for a new pastor, we need to get on with the Father's business. Much of what we are doing is maintaining that which was started long ago. We are past-oriented rather than future-focused. Now, I'm going to stay there for a minute because I believe that statement, and I am concerned about that statement. Our pastor of discipleship says we are past-oriented rather than future-focused. While we honor the past and those who follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit to plant and build this church, yes, we honor it. Oh, my goodness, we have a legacy. We have a history. But then the methods needed to reach a new generation are not the same as those used to bring us to this point in our history. Radically refocusing our groups will help build the church as a whole. It's not just about starting new classes or, or putting ourselves in a posture for growth. It is about moving forward, forward with intentionality and a purposeful agenda, a divine mission. Now, I'm going to read that again. I want you to hear it. I want you to think about it because it says we, excuse me, we're not just here to build a church and to, to grow up our church. It is about moving forward with intentionality and a purposeful agenda, a divine mission. The agenda is to be the church in our small groups, living out the five functions, and then watching God bring about the growth. And Pastor Scott finishes this section of this material with a challenge from the second chapter of Revelation where Jesus is speaking to the church of, at Ephesus. And it, Jesus has said some of the positive things that they have done. They have a good future. And they have done some very positive things. But then at the end of this section of, of Scripture, this is what Jesus says to the church at Ephesus. And he may be saying the very same thing to King's Grant Baptist Church. Listen very carefully. Jesus said, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. We are to be about the basic factors of our Christian experience. And part of what we're doing these next eight weeks is to amplify that through our small groups. And part of this and the tragedy of tragedies would be if we had our lampstand removed, which is a statement of our ministry and our fellowship and our goodness in the Lord being removed. Now, very quickly, I'm going to go through some of the guidelines for these small groups that are going to be operating and be teaching over these next eight weeks because there are some very effective guidelines in this that I would to ask all of us to be about considering and working on because the first one is attendance. We've read that we need to be together and to gather and to spur one another on to good deeds and to love. Well, we need to attend our small groups. So we're encouraging everybody to be a part of a small group, number one. And then as a part of the small group, we're encouraging everybody to attend in a regular, consistent manner, if at all possible. We understand that people, some people have to work, 
you have emergencies, you have family issues. Yes, yes, yes. But please, this whole refocus is necessary that we attend. The second guideline has to do with authority, and we have a scripture here. It says, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in highest regard and love because of their work. Now, we have some excellent teachers of our small groups. Some of you are sitting here. We thank the Lord for excellent teachers, prayerful and dedicated and prepared. And so we're asking that all of us in small groups respect and pray for and honor these leaders and what they're doing. And then we're encouraging participation. We all need to be involved, immersed, if you would, in the activities of these small groups. And here we have a scripture that says, From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. Here's the key phrase. As each part does its work. Well, you are a part of these small groups. And your participation is essential. Then we have the concept of accessibility. Now what that means is that in your small groups, we're encouraging everybody to be accessible to each other. To each other in any form or fashion. In any need that you or others might have. At any, at any time, not just on Sunday, but what about 2 o'clock in the morning? I don't want to be waked up, awakened at 2 o'clock in the morning. But if you need something, I'm willing to be w awakened at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's what accessibility is. Because we're family, we're part of this Christian community that we're, that we're emphasizing. So accessibility is very important. Romans 12.10 says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Yes. And then there's a guideline related to confidentiality. Now, let me emphasize this because in your small group to build relationships, there needs to be sharing, honest, open, sometimes hurtful sharing. I've experienced it many, many, many times. I've been in many groups over the years and I have shared some of the hurt or some of the, the difficulties. All of us have difficulties. All of us make mistakes. All of us get ourselves in difficult spots. And in your small group, there needs to be the sharing of that. Why? For the healing of yourself and also for the relationship building between you and other brothers and sisters in your group. But then there has to be respect and confidentiality. I think, I hope everybody's familiar with that term. That means to hold everything in proper regard when you've heard something from your brother or sister in a small group group, and not just share it randomly, particularly without permission. Now, there are a couple of proverbs here, and they have to do with what? They have to do with gossip. Let me tell you something. Gossip is a sin, and it is destructive to the church family. And confidentiality in our small groups is to prevent gossip where it goes outside the room and is talked about in the hallways or in the parking lot. And these two proverbs, a perverse man stirs up dissension and gossip separates close friends. We don't want separation of close friends. We want unity. And another proverb, he who covers over an offense promotes love. Yes, we have to accept because all of us make mistakes. And it says, if you cover over a mistake, an offense, you promote love. But it goes on to say, but whoever repeats the matter, as in repeats the matter outside of the small group, separates close friends. No, that is not to be. Another guideline has to do with prayer. We're asking that everybody pray for, for each other in your small group. It says in James 5, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you will be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Uh, 
we pray for each other. And we're promised through Scripture that when you as a brother or sister pray for others in your small group, that that is effective, that is healing, that is powerful through the Lord's Spirit. And then the last guideline or indication in the small group is what we're calling multiplication. Reaching out. And what I've done here is I just want to remind you of what we've talked about a lot here in recent weeks, and that is what we call the Great Commission. And it's in the 28th chapter of the book of Matthew, and it's Jesus saying to his disciples, verse 19 and 20, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything, that I have taught you. That's Jesus. He's not just talking 2,000 years ago to his disciples there. He's talking to you and me and in our small groups. We're to go and make disciples. We're to, we're to go and invite people. We're to bring people into our small group. We're to witness to them, to share with them the story of Jesus Christ and to make disciples. And we can't do that if we just sit here and don't participate and don't involve ourselves in relationships. So all of that's very important. Now, in conclusion, and I'm about to... I just rounded third and I'm going toward home. I know it's been a little bit of a trip around the bases, folks. But please, please understand the importance of this that we're doing today and we're doing for the next eight weeks. Because I share this scripture... From the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, I read earlier, but listen, because this is where we're heading. This is what we need. This is the objective. And it says, it was he who, it was Jesus Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then, this is where we're going, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, and that is Jesus Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, and it grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That's you. That's me in our small groups as each part does its work. Starting next week and for the month of October and November in your Sunday school classes, in your Bible study classes, in your small group, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be studying these things and working on these things and I am so thankful for Pastor Scott and what he has put together for the Lord and for us. It's got health and strength and biblical foundation about that. Now, for just a couple of minutes before we come toward the conclusion of our service, I'm going to ask you to just be silent and to pray specifically for this focus, refocus group on our small groups, the things that I've presented to you this morning. So please just take a moment and pray for this effort during these next two months. Please pray.